Last week we had a healing service. We dedicated the day to praying for uh, people for healing and nations and learning what the Bible says about that. Uh, one of the things that we discovered is that Jesus tells his followers, he expects his followers to heal the sick. He gives us first a demonstration of how he does it, then he uh, equips us with the power to do it, and then he sends us out. And uh, as you're trying to heal the sick, or if you're going to heal the sick, you have to try. So if you decide you're too shy, you will not be able to participate in this because it takes someone who's willing to just step out. You do not have to uh, do anything internally in terms of bravery. You don't have to be confident. And the odds are, for most of us, we won't be confident because we're going doing something that we aren't uh, capable of in our own strength, but God gives us the ability. So uh, in order to uh, try, you don't have to feel confident. All you have to do is just step out. Last week, we, or two weeks ago, we talked about how to change for the better, and when we were looking at that, we said one of the things you could do, or one of the best things you could do, is to ask God for direction, because if you make changes and they're not helpful, that won't uh, produce anything worthwhile for all your effort. But if you ask God for direction, then listen. And the most likely way that you're gonna hear from God is through a impression that you get that's very peaceful and quiet and not very assuming, just uh, easy to ignore. So test that out when you get an impression and see what's your track re record as you uh, sense these things, how often are they true? And that will allow you to discover if you're hearing from God in that way or not. I think most of you will discover that that's a primary way that you hear from God. The best advice for people who are trying to change is don't quit because there will be ups and downs. Uh, that's how it is when you're trying to change a habit or establish a new pattern. Uh, it has some successes and some uh, misses and near misses and some utter failures. If you don't quit, you will see, uh, or as maybe the people around you will see change before you do, but don't quit, keep at it. And write down how you'll make it through the pain. This is one of the things that studies have discovered is most helpful is if you think in advance about not just what good might happen, but what you might encounter in terms of obstacles, you will be able, if you think about that, to plan in advance. So someone who decides that they're going to uh, go running may, if they're new to running, they might feel like quitting every step of the way. And so you can have a plan in advance. Well, I will quit when I reach the first telephone pole. Or I will quit when I reach the first mile. And eventually, after you've uh, run enough, you can say, I'm not going to quit unless a leg falls off. It doesn't matter how much pain I'm in. I can see the benefit of this and the benefit of running through the pain. Uh, because when all, all, everything worthwhile is painful. There are times when you will think, if it was good for me, surely there wouldn't be this pain, but that's an illusion. Uh, often pain accompanies things that are, that are great and that are good. So if we have a strategy in advance for how we will work through that, it's often helpful. Okay, so that's a summary of where we've been for the last couple of weeks. Uh, today, I had uh, on my phone, I got a warning this morning that uh, my battery was down to 20%. So I plugged it in. And uh, I was using the phone uh, for a few things, and a little while later, uh, I got a 10% warning on the battery. And I looked at it, and I had plugged it in, but I plugged it at an angle, and it was not completely connected. So it wasn't receiving any juice, even though the one end was plugged into the electricity, but the 
uh, part connecting to my phone was not making a complete connection. So it was ready to fail. We've got, for those of you watching on video, I've got a great big giant version of this in the middle of the church. Uh, this is uh, something that Jesus said some people are like. Used to be vibrant, used to be healthy, used to be functioning and doing a great job, but this got cut off from the source and uh, now it's not healthy. And in fact, it's harmful. It's a fire hazard. Uh, and it, Jesus says it needs to be burned. So we'll look at that today. Uh, John 15, uh, if you want to follow along, John is in the New Testament. Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. So Jesus is using an illustration like this uh, tree. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. So when you stay connected to Jesus, you are connected to a source that is supplying life and health and you will be able to accomplish things that you can't accomplish unless you're connected with Jesus. Uh, apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Uh, this takes a little bit of explaining because you probably think it's not true. Uh, Jesus exaggerates to make a point from time to time, and this may be one where you just say, yeah, um, I can do plenty apart from Jesus. If that is true, that um, there are people who don't know Jesus or people who reject Jesus who can, who can accomplish a lot. And each of us can accomplish a lot without following Jesus. But Jesus says all of that is going to disappear and come to nothing. It may look impressive in the moment and it may last for some time, but it's going to count as nothing. The things that really matter are the things that you need to be connected with God in order to accomplish. But Everything else, you can build an empire, not just a great building or program. You can build a tremendous empire. It's not going to last unless the source of the power is through God and Jesus. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So Jesus is warning people that they don't want to be in this state and telling them how to, how to get out of it. That um, by connecting with Jesus, you can not only stay healthy, but you can have uh, resources that will help you do the th impossible things that God tells you to do. So many of us are not doing the things Jesus tells us to do because they look impossible. Uh, but if we will try, we will discover over time that we are able, because God equips us, to do things that we couldn't do on our own strength. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians next. It's one of the letters of Paul, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, we walk by something, not by something. So I thought I would toss this just in the middle here and see, I bet that some of you have memorized a Bible verse and didn't even know it. So those of you who've opened the Bible to 2 Corinthians 5, please don't answer for a second. Those of you who are not following along, can you fill in the uh, first blank? We walk by what? Faith. All right. There's a whole bunch of you who've memorized a Bible verse, whether you knew it or not. We walk by faith, not by what? By sight. Not by sight. All right. So you know the verse, but I bet you're not living it. I bet for almost all of us, we're walking by sight. We look around and say, wow, there's a lot of empty spaces here. That's not good. Instead of walking by faith and trusting God's promises. We look in our checkbook and see by sight what's in there, and we, uh, I was at an ATM uh, 
a month ago, and the customer ahead of me left the receipt in there. And I was going to just crumple it up, but when I saw that in his checking, his checking balance was $100,000, I decided to give him the receipt just in case he needed it to remind him. Uh, so you can look in your checkbook and think, woohoo, uh, plenty here. Uh, that's walking by sight. Or looking in there and thinking, ugh, I'm never going to make it. That's walking by sight. Uh, but God equips us to be living on a different plane. This is not saying that God equips you to be irresponsible. But God equips you to be responsible living in a different reality, not by what things look like, but knowing that the power of God flows through you because you follow Jesus, so you have the ability to at least try. When someone is not healthy, you can reach out in healing. Whether you believe you can do anything or not, you can try. Uh, so we walk by faith, not by sight. And there are times when you'll have to try for quite a while before you see any result. Uh, partly this is because we don't get a lot of feedback, especially when there's good news. We don't hear a lot of the feedback. But also this is true because we're just learning. We need some practice. It'll take a while before we get as good as we'll be after practice. <clears throat> Romans 10. So in Romans, Paul is uh, talking about what it's like in the world. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you, in, in one sense, you don't have to worry about all of creation because God is so merciful that anyone who calls out to God will be saved. And Paul says, some people aren't calling out because they don't know that. They don't know there is a God who loves them. They don't know that all they have to do is call out. So Paul says, how are they to call on one in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? So someone, needs to find a way to talk to people, some of whom don't want to hear, they think, some of whom uh, are not listening. How can you get the message to people who need to know that God loves them when some of them are ignorant and don't know what they need? Matthew 9. And I, I, can hear, I can hear the uh, whispering. I'm so glad we're jumping around the Bible like this. It's giving me lots of practice to show that I can turn the pages fast. That's just awesome. Matthew 9. Jesus is talking. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So some of you, I have not checked out a rumor some of you have told me. So I probably shouldn't repeat it. Uh, but I suppose I will. Uh, some of you have told me that, uh, that the prices of berries are up. I haven't noticed that because I shop at a store where they're always up. But some of you shop at better venues and, uh, and have reported that um, there's not enough people picking the berries and so the prices have gone up. I don't know if that's true or not. But I can tell you that that is how it works even if that's not how it is today that if there's not enough workers, the berries stay on the vine. And they go bad. They don't get better the longer they stay on the vine. Uh, the, so somebody needs to go and pick them. And if there are a few laborers, you lose that harvest. It's not that it'll wait. So hearing that, we've been asking members from uh, a couple weeks ago through Easter if they wouldn't pray into this. Do what Jesus asks us to do in response to this situation, that around the world there are people who really need to know about God and God's love and about what Jesus has done and about the Holy Spirit available to anyone who asks. And the harvest is plentiful, but there's not many laborers, not enough laborers. 
So Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Ask God to send out enough people so that the harvest wouldn't be lost. There are people that this is the day that they are interested in hearing about God and God's love. And tomorrow, they're not gonna be interested because something is gonna happen and that door is gonna close. So ask God to send out laborers into the harvest. Matthew 13. Jesus tells a story about what it's like when you go out into the harvest, so we'll look at that next. Jesus says there's a sower who went out to sow. And uh, as he sowed, some of the seed fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I saw this as a kid. My dad had seeded in a large area that needed, it had no grass in it, but it needed it. Uh, it used to be a driveway and now it was being turned into a lawn. And so uh, it was a massive area that got seed all over it and a flock of several hundred birds came in and had the happiest day of their life. Uh, and uh, it happened twice before the third time the birds had flown somewhere else. And uh, the third time the seed was able to take root. There are times when uh, you will announce the love of God and people will not understand. Maybe because you're saying it in such a complicated way that they can't get it. Maybe because you're not using their language. Or maybe just because uh, they've somehow had their ears stopped and their eyes veiled. But if you keep at it and if you ask God to be able to bring the message in a way that they can understand, God will help you so that when you scatter the seed, it doesn't get eaten immediately. But Jesus says the interpretation of this one is that if someone hears the good news and doesn't understand it, it's taken away right away by, by Satan. So as you're going out proclaiming the good news, it's helpful to ask for God to allow people to understand and for you to have words that would help people to understand the message. Other seeds, Jesus said, fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. So this, at first, looks awesome. Scatter some seeds, and way ahead of schedule, they're sprouting. It's wow. But what's happened is, for most plants, their first burst of energy is supposed to go in putting out a root system so that they can have something that'll keep them in the ground when there's a big wind, when there's something tugging at them, so that they are able to get nutrients from the soil and from the rain. Their first job is to put down roots, and all their, or most of their energy goes there. If they hit a rock and can't put down roots, then they do the next, next best thing, they spring up. So if you're on rocky ground, it can be deceptive. It looks at first like everything's coming to life early. But in fact, what's happened is a crucial step has been missed. They haven't put down roots. And so when the sun rose, they were scorched. They can't handle it when things are bad uh, because they don't have enough depth, enough fruit. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed, Jesus said, fell among thorns. Thorns grew up and choked them. And as Jesus describes each of these to his disciples and interprets it, he says, uh, this is primarily what you're gonna find in La Jolla. Uh, except he didn't actually use our name. Uh, but he said, you're gonna find a lot of seeds that uh, grow and look vibrant, but have no fruit. Nice bush, no fruit. And the reason for that is because they're growing in an area where it's easy to be tempted 
by riches and by other things going on. And so they will flourish, but they won't have enough of a commitment to, the, they'll, they're gonna look off to the side and see other things that are interesting that they don't have. They're gonna wish that they had those. They might pursue things that aren't of value but look dazzling anyway. And because of the attention to things that don't matter in the long run, that glancing over and focusing on things that look dazzling but aren't any good will cause them to, the energy, that energy should have been put into bearing fruit and having some good, but they're going to have no fruit. Jesus said there's a uh, last kind of seed that falls on good soil and it brings forth grain. Sometimes a hundred times more than what you sent out. Sometimes 60 times more, sometimes 30 times more. So there's some people that in your lifetime, you're gonna bring 30 people to Jesus to help them know about God and God's love in that, uh, in that because of you, 30 people are gonna be in heaven. 30 people are gonna have their lives so transformed that they're going to influence the people around them, the businesses they're in, the schools they're in, the families they're raising. It will be impossible to tell the value of what you have done by changing these 30 people for the better and helping them to come into relationship with God who loves them. But there's other people that they're gonna be able to influence 60 or 100. So I'm so thankful for those of you who have uh, helped someone find Jesus or helped someone uh, discover God's love. And there's 29 more or 59 more, or 99 more that will happen during your lifetime, and I'm so thankful for what you're doing because it's changing and transforming the world. Let anyone, Jesus says, with ears, listen. So as the disciples are hearing stories like this and seeing the call of God on their life to go out and do things, uh, they wonder uh, because Jesus tells them that in a community like ours, it's going to be very difficult for someone to enter heaven. It's going to be very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you take a look at the stats for the world, uh, this probably applies to anyone in America, that almost everybody in America, no matter how poor, is quite rich compared to other nations of the world. Uh, bad news for that group because it's hard to enter God's kingdom. Jesus says, uh, let me tell you how hard it's going to be. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Uh, we don't have a camel here today. Has anybody been to the zoo? Uh, so a few of you have seen a real camel, right? Uh, does it look at all likely that no matter how hard a camel squeezed, it could get through the eye of a needle? No, it's not even, it's not possible, right? It's not that, well, if the camel really tries and goes on a diet and does a lot of stuff, then the camel will make it. It might take 10 or 20 years, but the camel will be able to do it. No, there is no chance ever that the camel can do it. That's the status. Everybody who thinks, oh, I'm a good person, I'm gonna make it based on my works, there is no chance. It doesn't matter how hard you try and how long you try and how good you are. It, the standards are such that there's no way you're gonna squeeze in there and make it. It's easier for a camel to go through a needle than someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so then the disciples, uh, followers of Jesus, said, well, who can be saved? And I find their comment curious. Bec 
Uh, but, but they're of the opinion that if a rich person can't be saved, nobody is going to make it. They're of the opinion that at least the people at the top should be able to make it into the kingdom of heaven. And maybe all the commoners know, but, but at least the people at the top ought to be able to make it. And if the people at the top can't make it, then what hope does anybody have? Now, um, some of us maybe come from a different philosophy that think, well, yeah, of course the people at the bottom are going to find it much easier, and maybe they, they can make it into heaven quite easily. But that's not the disciples' point of view. The disciples' point of view is, if the rich can't even make it, there's no hope for anybody. And so Jesus says, yes, it's impossible. For mortals, it's impossible. But for God, all things are possible. So, word to all the mortals, trying to make it through your best efforts. It'll never work. It'll never work. It is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. If you are relying on yourself, it'll never work. If you connect with God, all things are possible. So best advice from a couple weeks ago, don't quit. So in the context of sowing, that means that you go out, tell a few people about Jesus, a couple of them say, stop that, we don't want to hear anything like that on Facebook, we don't like to hear that kind of stuff. Uh, we're much happier hearing about all the things that make us mad on Facebook, so please don't come with things that are nice and helpful. Uh, you will hear from time to time a few comments that you should quit. And first century Christians, looking at what causes 21st century Christians to quit, would have their jaws open. People who did not quit in the face of torture, looking at Christians who stop because they're a little inconvenienced, or put down by a couple people, cannot imagine what we're thinking. How could you know about God and not tell people who are going to be separated from God forever? Their day, for people whose day is today, this is the day and they are going to rot on the vine if this day somebody doesn't meet them where they need. Why don't you stand? I'm so glad, Jesus, for all the distracting things and the distracting ways by which we can win. Uh, we uh, have scorecards for pick up basketball games and for video games and for uh, our lives and for all kinds of things that you let us know it's not going to last. But there are some things that are going to last. Love lasts. Hope lasts. Faith lasts. Father, there's a lot of people without hope today because no one has told them that you love them. There's a lot of people without faith today because no one has walked alongside them and helped them to see in the pain spots of their life that you have been there helping them along the way because you love them so much. And that there is a route out of the pain that they're in. 
and that they can ask for the Holy Spirit any time that they ask, and any time they want. Father, we do ask, as Jesus asked us to, that you would send out workers into the harvest, that you would send laborers out into the harvest. Thank you for your mercy for us and for your world, we praise you. Amen. If you're ready for a change, ask Jesus to be your Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Read the Bible every day. It has information you cannot find anywhere else. If you're new to the Bible, I'd recommend you start in Matthew and go from there. Uh, find a church where you can grow in faith. Actually, if you just stay in Matthew for the rest of your lifetime, it would be fine. But um, uh, find a church where you can grow in faith and then do what Jesus tells you to do.